Bottle. Can I use one of your bottles? The bottle. The bottle, you need it? You need it? Yeah? Thank you so much. Hi, welcome, welcome. Okay. You know what? I'm going to put this here. It's going to be better. Okay. Good morning. Do you guys see me? Everyone see me? Yeah, we're good? Okay. Today we are starting to learn um, one of our main spam for the year. Um, the safer is called Tomer Devora. Now, I just want to make a few announcements. First of all, the actual English translation of Tomer Devora um, is there's one English translation of it, uh, like a, a good English translation. Mm. There's a bunch of that are not good. Okay? Mm. Uh, Reviton bought last year everybody a Tomer mm. Devora, but it wasn't the one that we needed. Mm. So basically, this is the way it's going to go. Last year, the whole year, we tried to get you guys this book because it's a hundred shekel book, it's in English. Okay, it's like it's like a fancy art school kind of fell time or art school one of those books. Okay, and it costs a hundred shekels. The school could not afford buying every girl a hundred shekels safer, so they ended up buying like these like small tomer devoras that were not useful at all. We didn't use them at all. What I'm asking of you is, if you can buy yourself this book, the tomer devora book. Okay, I'll send you a picture of exactly what it looks like. I'll put it on the group. Go to this farm store and buy it for yourself. It's an awesome book, A. You're going to love it. It has good stories and it has, it's a really good book. And it's our textbook for this class. So we really, really need it. The school's not going to buy it. I'm just letting you know right now, the school cannot buy this book for this class. Um, you can get a, a, another version of this book, but it's not going to help you at all. It's just hard, 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 hard. Very difficult Hebrew, like almost impossible to learn, almost impossible to understand. You need the English version, basically. But it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile. Um, so after this class... I'm going to, if it's okay, one of you come up to me, um, give me your number, and I'm going to send you a picture of this book, and then you'll put it on the on the class chat. Okay? Yeah? We're good? Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Now, how many of you heard of the Safer Call Tomer Devora? We just want the seminary. Yeah. Not the actual seminary, Tomer Devora. Yeah, but the... That's all we know. That's really. all you know. Yeah. Okay, cool. Fine. Blank states are awesome. You've heard of the Tomer Devora. Okay. Have you been to sem- to the cemetery in Tfat yet? No. no. Yes. yes, I've been there. You've been there. The big cemetery. No, the big cemetery in Tfat. My grandpa was buried there. Look. Okay. So the. I think it was your It was all yeah, meant to be. Sorry, Instagram. Facebook. We're on Facebook. Facebook. Are you Facebook live your classes? Uh, yeah. That's so cool. I love your yeah, you see, it's for anyone that misses our classes, they could just go on Instagram and get it, or on Facebook, mainly on Facebook. Okay, so this book, okay, a quick introduction to this book, okay, the author who wrote this book, his name is the Ramak, the Ramak is, uh, stands for Reish Mem Kuf, it stands for Rav Moshe Kordaviro, Rav Moshe Kordaviro was a scholar that lived in Tzfat, he was actually, you know whose Rebbe he was? Yes. Guess who's Rebbe he was? Who's very famous and we all know him? Rambam. No? Mm-hmm. Yes! Good, who said that? Nice! How'd you know that? I guess. She guessed. You want her on your, uh, on your team. Um, the Ariza was his, Rebbe, was, his, was his Talmud. The Ramak's student was the Ariza, the one that brought Torah Kabbalah into the world. Okay, um, so that's his student. Now, the person that wrote this book, the Ramak, who's the Arizal's Rebbe, the Sefer is almost impossible to understand. It's really, really, really difficult to understand. The Hebrew is really, really difficult. I'm a fluent Hebrew speaker. Really hard to understand what he's talking about. Anyone that's whispering, take it outside, girls. Just take it outside. We're good. I'm good. I don't care having like 10 girls, but as long as the girls that are here are here. Okay? So... Um, the Sefer is such a hard Sefer to understand that it was kind of like only left for people that were like major Kabbalists to learn this book. Okay, it's a Kabbalistic book. It's based on, um, it's based on the whole book. What, what The part that we're learning is one chapter out of the whole book. Okay, and this book that I'm asking you to buy is that one chapter out of the whole Tomer Devorah book. Okay, it's come to light, this book. So this book was written 450 years ago. Okay, it was, it's a very ancient text. It was written 400 years ago in Tzfat and by the Ramak. 
And when the Ramak passes away, this is what happens right before he passes away. Listen to this, okay? First of all, he was 48 years old when he passed away, okay? And he says like this. His Talmidim were around his bed when he, on his, on his uh, uh, death, the day of his death. They were all gathered up around his bed, and they all asked him, Rebbe, who's going to be our next Rebbe? How are we going to know who is he going to be? Like, how we can, we need a sign to know who's that person. Now, all their rabbim were holy, 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 mm-hmm. holy humans. Right? They weren't just like, oh, you'll just have another teacher. Right? They needed, they needed a sign to know. And what happened was that he told them, he said to them, that by his funeral, by his funeral, something is going to happen. And the person that's going to do this by his funeral, you know this? Yeah? The person that's going to do this by his funeral, that's their next rabbi. And so he passes away, the Ramak passes away, they bring him into the cemetery in Sfat, where you're going to go. Okay, if you're going to go to his cave, you're going to go to the Ramak's cave, and that, they bring him to the cemetery in Sfat, they bury him. They're about to bury him in a certain place. And all of a sudden, a fire comes down, okay, a fire appears in the sky over a certain burial place. Okay, now they don't see the fire. Only one person sees the fire. Who's the one person that sees the fire? A man. A man that's in the cemetery. There's another man that's walking around the cemetery, and he sees this fire that's coming down, and he says to them, you're not supposed to bury your Rebbe over there. You're supposed to bury him here. I know you're supposed to bury him here. And they're like, get out of our face. No, we're not. We're like, we're burying him here. This is where he's meant to be buried. And they said, no, and he said to them, I'm telling you, he's not supposed to be buried there. He's supposed to be buried here. Okay, now remember what the Ramak told them. The Ramak mm-hmm. said that something in mm-hmm. his funeral is going to happen, and it's gonna, that's the, the sign that this is their new Rebbe. So, what happened? It turns out that the Arizal was that man in the cemetery. The Arizal was the one that saw the pillar of fire. And the Arizal was the one that determined where the Ramak was going to be buried. So when you're going to go to his cemetery now, when they're going to take you up to the cemetery and to the Ramak's cave, just know that the Arizal moved them from where they were meant to bury him to where he's buried today. Because he saw a, a, an Amud Ish. Uh, 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 a brick, like a, fi- a wall of fire coming down, and, and this was where he needed to be buried. This was where Mark needed to be buried. That's when they knew that this was their new Rebbe. They knew that the Arizal was going to be their new Rebbe from this experience. And they made him their new Rebbe. Do you know how long the Arizal lived in Tzfat? When you go to Tzfat, how many of you have been to Tzfat without, without the school? Okay, most of you haven't been to Tzfat. You guys. What? Oh, because of the war. All right, it's time to get your little rear ends to spot. ASAP, okay? ASAP. So the whole spot is blue, okay? The whole spot is painted. All the walls in spot are ba- basically all the walls in spot are pl- painted blue. Thresholds are all blue. Everything is blue. And the reason for Where is everything blue? All over its spot. It's all like, the doors. It's like they're, they're now you're going to see it. Like attic, yeah. Now you're going to see it. Around, now you're going to notice it. And I spent like two weeks there. Is it true? You didn't notice the, everything being blue? Not all is it true? Every single thing. It just looked like the, the doors. The doors are blue. What is that? I don't know. Okay. This time you're going to go. You'll see the blue. I was there with my grandparents. You want to know where they took me as a trip? They took me to see the first spring water mix club. Wow. It was, it was, it was, it was interesting. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> spring, fresh spring water mix club. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. My grandmother was like, no, don't bring her there. She's going to see naked men. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so for the rest of us, so Tzfat is one of the holy four holy cities. Okay, Tzfat is one of the four holy cities. We have Jerusalem, Tzfat, Hebron, and Tveria. Good. Jerusalem is stands for they're they're, they're all connected the four elements. They're all connected the four elements. Jerusalem is connected which element? Nope. Fire. Good fire. Jerusalem is fire. What's Tfat? Water. Nope. Earth. Earth. Nope. Air. 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 Good. Air. What's Hebron? Earth. 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 And it's good because it's, it's ground. Good. And what's Tveria? Water. Water. Mm-hmm. Good. That's those. Every single city has its energy. Okay. That's why you'll have people that are fire, fire people have a very hard time living in Jerusalem. Oftentimes they'll go places that are more earth or more water. Because, or more ground, really it's ground and fire and air and fire, because water puts out 
fire, so it's not a, the best place. You'll have people, depending on your energy, and there's a whole safer that we can eventually get to, get to eventually. If we, if we finish one, we finish the Tumor Devorah. It's about the four elements and you, meaning every single one of us, has, we're, we're comprised of the four elements, fire, earth, water, and wind. And we, based on your character, we have a different combination, a composition of those things. Like, for example, I'll have more fire and a little bit of air, and you'll have a lot of ground and a little bit of fire. Okay, but we all have all four. I have to say all of us. We just have different amounts of it, okay? So when you go to certain cities, one second, when you go to certain cities, depending on your energy, is going to be how well you connect to that city. Okay, and it can change over the course of your life. Because you could be more fiery when you're younger and more grounded when you get older because you had those elements in you already and you just developed, let's say, the more earth part of you as opposed to the more fire part of you. Fire people are people that, let's say, burn their bridges. They get really excited. They get really passionate. They get really charismatic about something and they, like, leave their job without having a new job, right? They burn, they burn through things, but also good things come from it because they move fast, they move fast, they do things fast. A lot of times they're, they're the ones that are the leaders and things. A lot of times they're the ones that have the amazing idea, the crazy idea, but they're not the ones that are going to actually implement it. The, the people that are going to implement it are more the water people or the earth people. They're the ones that love the like nitty-gritty, crossing every T, dotting every I. They're the eight personality type, right? But then you'll have, so, okay, so each city has its energy. And the energy of spot is air. Air is spirituality, Okay? You'll have people during the times of the Torah, people that were not pure, that spoke to Shonara, they went there. Okay? Because why? Because that was their ear miklat. Meaning you'll have people from all walks of Jewish life living in Tzfat, and you'll be like, at a certain point, you'll give up the whole like, oh, that person's weird. Oh, that person's weird. You'll just give it up. Because you just have an eclectic group of people that cling to that place because spiritually, their neshama connects to them. What's your name? Me? Yeah. Aviva. Aviva? Aviva's neshama did not connect to Tzfat. Okay? <laughs> her neshama did not connect to that vibe because her energy is probably the opposite of that. So Aviva is probably more fire, okay, in her personality. So that means that the fire and the air, you have to learn more about the fire, then you'll understand. Fire and the air, they, don't, they oftentimes make a big fire. Okay? And that makes people feel not grounded, not calm, not happy. You'll have some people that go there and they're super calm and super grounded and con- super happy. Could that stuff be connected to, like, let's say your zodiac? Yeah, it's it's and it's so not my, connected exactly, but it it could be connected. My my zodiac sign is a water sign. That's not so it's not connected. Oh. It's not connected, but it makes sense that you're water. It makes a lot of sense. Anyway, um, it's not connected and it is connected. It's not and it's it's two different things. The stars is different from the energy. A person's energy is different from their from their zodiac. Do you think my energy is fire? I think that part of your energy is definitely fire. The part of you that's fire is the part of you that couldn't stand the, like, the, maybe you noticed even, you didn't notice the blue walls, but did you notice the dirt? Yes. Oh, my goodness. It was so dirty and dusty. The whole place smelled like burnt bushes. I think because there was a lot of wildfires when I was there. Okay. Uh, yes. Maybe you caught oh, that because you're fire. so bad. Uh, <laughs> what would you rather, a camping trip or a beautiful hotel? A beautiful hotel. <laughs> would anyone definitely. take a camping trip? Yes. yes. Yes, what? a lot of people would. I mean, I would like to go to a camping trip, but if it's... Fine. You're definitely water. You're definitely water. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. Okay, so what happens here by this thing, by this, this situation that we're talking about with the Tomer Devora, what happened here is that the Arizal stays in Tzfat, and he ends up bringing... And brings a, Kabbalah into Tzfat, he opens this whole thing of Kabbalah that no one was learning till then, basically. Even like Yechidim were learning, they had like, the, they didn't even have printed Tzfarim. They borrowed from each other's Tzfarim because they didn't have printed Kabbalistic Tzfarim. Meaning the whole mystical world of Judaism, souls, next world, mysticism, energies, all these things, there wasn't the talk. It was not the talk. People never spoke this way. The Arizal shows up in Tzfat the day the Ramak passes away and he becomes Tzfat which means he opens up all of the learning that he's done with the different malachim. He learned with Eliyahu and Navi. You'll go to Tzfat, you'll go to the room where the Rizal sat with, the, with Eliyahu and Navi and learned Kabbalah and brought it down. You'll go into the shul, into the room where it's brought down, and that's where he sat with him and learned with him. Okay? It's, a, it's an amazing experience. You have to go there for Shabbos. Yeah, yeah. Rabbi, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Orbach does an amazing tour there. Amazing tour. So um, the Rizal lived there all together. All, all of his years together in Tzfat were two years. And then he passes away. That's it. The Arizal? The Arizal. 
two years he spends in Tzfat. I know, I also thought so. Yeah, Rizal brought... Oh, that was really cool. That Rizal was young. Yeah, he was there for two years. He was there for two years, and he passes away. Okay. It says that the Shla, the Shla Kadosh, <coughs> said about the Torah Devorah, that whoever gets used to reading it every week or month and completing it is Ben Olam Haba. This Sefer... This Tomer Devorah Sefer comes with a lot of segulos and promises. That's part of the reason why I forced myself to teach it and learn it. Why? Because it starts with the fact that it's an insane book, insane teachings. Until I, until, until I started teaching the Tomer Devorah, I didn't know this whole section of Torah existed. I didn't know that this concept existed. And I've been teaching and learning and teaching and learning and teaching and learning since I'm very young. Never knew this whole concept existed. I went to Bisakov, I went to two years of seminary, I went to speeches and classes and... Th- Never knew this whole thing existed. It's all Kabbalah. We're learning Kabbalah. That's why I need you to have this book. Because if you don't have the book, the experience is going to be just so diluted for you. Just so diluted. And you want to take the bull by the horn. You want to sit in this class and you want to, you want to get this book. What? Any farm store. The English book. It's called Tomer Devora. Uh, I'm going to send you the picture. Is it long? I'll explain to you what it is. Okay, I'm going to give you the information as to what it is, how it goes. Das Nafshecha. Know your, your, know your soul. It's called the Four Elements book. Das Nafshecha. Okay, so, yeah. So if you read the English, for sure you're going to be able to understand it. But there's no reason because we have a class on it this year, so we're good. Um, you can read ahead, definitely read ahead. The way it works is like this. The, the Tomer Devora says like this. You learn my book. There's a segula that whoever learns this book is cured. <laughs> God forbid, from cancer. Okay? There have been many, 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 many stories of cancer patients that have started learning this book and have been cured. Like, like miraculously, they couldn't find the tumors. Okay? This book is incredible for health, and it's incredible also for, he says that if you learn this book, you're Ben Olam Haba. You have a piece in the next world. Yeah, but you want to have as many pieces as you can in the next world. Okay? You want them to come from all different directions. This learning, this book, he says, just learning it, you learn, you complete it, you read it, you, you read it once a week, you read it once a month, you learn it, we're, le- we're learning here once a week, you're going to be rewarded in the next world. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Okay. So the Divri Chaim, the Divri Chaim, he sounds, he says like this. He says that reading the Torah Devorah is the segula to protect one from illness. Any illness. I, we did this together during Corona with a group. And no one got corona in from that group. Okay, it was very cool. Tomer Devorah is a safer Kabbalah that delves into... What? You always get sick? So it's really, really, really important to learn this book, for sure. And are you vaccinated? You are vaccinated. So certain things you need to do. Okay. Certain things you need to do. Because the vaccine is not so healthy, you know, just like any medication is not so healthy. Oh, not, not COVID vaccine. You didn't get that? No. Okay, good. never got COVID Wait, wait, wait. I, I need the vaccine. I got COVID. I have natural antibodies. Oh, hey. Good for you. I never I got the vaccine. I never got the vaccine. Well, you I need to know. Know. Everyone got the vaccine. No one got the vaccine. Where do you live? Well, okay. Like, you got it? You got it? I have a grandma. She managed to get it to me right now. Oh, my God. Okay, back to our topic. And attendance. Yay. Okay. No, if, if, if we have any vaccine, or the COVID vaccine, you see the vaccines. The way they, the way it's used is that just like any medication a person takes. For example, they take Adderall. Adderall doesn't. It's not free, right? People have side effects, right? Stomach aches, heart palpitations, can't sleep at night, mouth, mouth getting very dry. It has a lot of other, right? You do get the focus, but at the same time, you also pay a price. So any medication. Comes with a price, mm-hmm. including, vaccine, including the including the vaccinations. Okay, a it's it's a it's it, there's a lot of aluminum in it. There's a lot of different metals in it, and that's how they create them. The metals, the metals over over the years, they start causing issues. So it's better to, to detox from metals as much as possible. First of all, oh, we'll get into that. Different I'm sorry, class. we'll get into the different. Class. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I love talking about vaccines, <laughs> but not now. 
Because right now it's a big eight to her to talk about it. And right now we're learning Torah. Why? Oh, because, because it's Torah. Right. Yes. Coming on Cheshbon uh, Torah. Okay? Okay, so what? What What do you want me to do? Swing my hair? No. What? I'm going to put the brach on you. You pick the brach on you and makes your stomach, your stomach hurts right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. So learning this book will bring upon no illness, Bezat Hashem. Okay. And it's brought down from many different sources that it's happened and it's proved and tested throughout the generations. Okay? It's not, a, it's not a book that was written yesterday. It was written 450 years ago by the Rebbe of the Arizal. So we have to what to depend on, okay? And the actual text, the actual teachings of this book, you're not going to learn anywhere else. Okay? You might learn a lot of other things that you're learning in the other classes and also with me in other places in your life. You will not learn this anywhere else unless you go learn the Tomer Devorah. Okay? So, and I also don't think that any other school is giving over this class because it's become it's become the Torah of Mashiach. No, they don't. Oh, they're called Tomer Devorah and they don't learn Tomer Devorah? They don't teach it. They don't teach it. So, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Should I drive you there on the bus? This this safer. This safer, Aviva, one second. This safer, okay, is a safer that's relaunched itself over the last few years. Meaning, it's something that's been buried. It's something that hasn't been touched. It's something that no one could understand. It's something that you had to like learn Kabbalah for many, many, many years to even know the lingo. You didn't understand the lingo, and now it's in English. Now it's translated, and now the amount of different gedolim that have brought down that it's such a major safer to learn. It's not just learning, whatever, Mesil Sasharim. Not that, not that I'm saying. It's just. It comes with yeah. a lot of segulas attached to it from very many different tzaddikim throughout the generations that have said, learn this, you will see your life turn upside down in a good way. Blessings will come to you. You're going to be married in, you're going to marry the next world and you're going to be free of illness in this world. Now we know that illness comes to people, right, that Hashem is trying to talk to. Oftentimes, God talks to different people in different ways. God will talk to me by, I don't know, by, by sending me something. Uh, not, uh, well, God will talk to someone by giving them an illness We'll talk to another person by not giving them children. We'll talk to another person by holding them off from getting married. We'll talk to another person by, uh, by not allowing them to find their dream job or to succeed. Why do we have issues in our life? Because Hashem wants us to turn up. Turn up. Not out. Up. Right? He gets our attention when He makes it a little tighter for us. Just like I do to my kids. Right? When they get everything that they want, they have their Nintendo Switch, and they have their, all their games, and they have all their nosh, and they have all their friends, oftentimes they will trash the house, not see, not care, not notice, not feel, not anything. They're just like on a rampage. They just want to eat and have fun. Eat and have fun, eat and have fun, because that's the human condition. We just want to eat and have fun. Till today, adults want to just eat and have fun. We all are a bunch of pleasure-seeking beings in this world that just want to do what feels good. And not what's hard, or what makes me sweat, or what makes me hurt, work hard. I don't have the head for that. Give me what feels good, and that's why people that make the most money are on social media and all these things. Why? Because that's what feels good to most people. Right? So, the way Hashem gets people's attention in this world, because that's really what's good for us, is by taking away what feels good for a minute. Taking away what feels good, all of a sudden the person doesn't have money, all of a sudden they don't have a place to live, all of a sudden they can't find a car, all of a sudden they can't find a guy to date, all of a sudden they can't... And it gets tight. And when it gets tight, you have one of two options. Option number one is to get angry, to get bitter, to get resentful, to walk around with your head down between your legs and not want to look up at life because it's depressing and it's hard and you don't have what it takes and you don't know what to do. That's option number one. Option number two is to lift your eyes to the sky and say, you, I know that in a second you can open up all the pipelines in my life. I know that in a second you can give me everything that's going to make me the happiest girl in the world that I'm just going to skip around the school and just be on fire. I know that you have no problem doing that. I also know that the reason that you're giving me this hard time is because you want me to talk to you. Oh, so I, want to, I need to talk to you. Because when I talk to you, all this stuff comes out of me. And when I hear all this gook that's coming out of me, all the low self-esteem, the low self-worth, the feeling of like not like really wanting to do anything, the apathy towards life, the not being motivated, the not feeling like I have what to give, what to do, or what to any potential, like I don't know what to do, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's where I am. When I say all of that to him and I just have some verbal vomiting situation going on and I just get it all out of me, all of a sudden I heal myself. Why does it say that a person that learns this book doesn't need healing? When you learn this book, 
You're going to become aware of so many things that you haven't become aware of till now, and you're going to just start doing it. You're going to see yourself start doing things you've never done before. You don't need healing if you're in the field, if you're in the game, if you're in the game. When you're sitting on the sidelines, depressed, not motivated, I don't have what it takes, whatever, I don't care, I don't know what to do, it's too big for me, it's too large for me, life is larger than life at the moment for me, I don't know what to do. When you're feeling that way and you're sitting, you're sitting on the sidelines, God needs to poke you and prod you in order for, to bring you into the game. This book keeps you in the game. And that's why you don't need to get sick. God doesn't need to make anyone sick if they're aware. Hashem doesn't need to give us any trouble if we're alive in our life. The problem is that we die in our life so often. We become numb. We become on autopilot. We become habitual. And then we become depressed. Because human beings love change, love passion, love new things, love coming out of their comfort zone, love it. We hate it and love it at the same time. We avoid it like the plague, and then we love it when we do it. So what did he say when he said suppressed? Suppressed? Depressed. Depressed? When we do the same thing all the time, every single day. We eat the same way, we talk the same way, we act the same way, we show up the same way to our friends, to our classes, to our life. When we do everything, on the, we're creatures of habit, so we fall into habit. Second. We're creatures of habit, so we fall into habit. When we fall into habit, we get depressed. Because we're really creatures of change. We really thrive on change, on newness, on coming out of our comfort zone, on trying new things. We thrive on that. We're terrified of that at the same time. So we're terrified of it, so it keeps us in our hole. And when we, and when we stay in our hole, we get depressed. Because we really want and we crave change. And when we go out there and we do the things that scare us so much, like coming out of our comfort zone, doing things that are different, doing things that I never usually do, doing those things, then I feel alive. I feel so alive and I feel so myself. But I'm terrified of touching those things, of breaking my habits, of coming out of my comfort zone. So people stay stuck in a prison. They stay stuck in a prison. Because really the equation for us human beings is so simple, but it's so not simple. It's so simple. We want all the good without doing all the work because the work means that we have to, in our brains, makes it, makes it painful, meaning I equate work with pain. I equate, equate exercising with pain. I equate not eating unhealthy food with pain. I equate not touching that guy with pain. I equate all these things with pain, and really those are the best things in the world for me. Eating well, exercising, keeping myself with the right man, doing all, pushing myself to work hard because then I'll get that degree or I'll get that job or I'll, I'll, I'll move up. Those are all the best things for me that make me feel alive and free and there I make money and I have good relationships and I feel good and I'm happy. But what I want to do is the opposite of that. I want to stay in my hole. I want to stay the same. I don't want to give up on my food. I don't want to give up on my guys. I don't want to give up on my, on my sleeping till whatever. I don't want to give up on, like, I don't want to give up. I'm like, I don't want to go exercising now. It's too cold. I'm too, I don't feel like it. I don't want to wake up early. I'm not in the mood. It's too hard. But that was, that's what gives me life. That's what gives me life. And the opposite of that, staying in the comfort zone is what gives me death. Because depression is death. It's living dead. It's living dead. It's really not living. So it's very, very, very simple. But it's very, very, very hard. Because we avoid it like the plague. We avoid coming out of our comfort zones like it's painful. Because it is painful. But it's not painful. I'll, give, I'll tell you a little thing that I never really shared with anyone. So right now when we were in Florida, my kids, we had a pool obviously. Because everybody has pools there. So we had a pool. And I was in the pool with them. And they were like, Ima, did you ever jump in? Did you ever, like, like, cannonball into the pool? And I was like, no, no, I'm too rusty for that. <laughs> They're like, no, no, really, did you ever do it in your life? I was like, I don't think so. I don't think I ever cannonball into a pool in my life. And they were like, they almost, like, literally, they freaked out at me. They ended up pushing me out of the pool, but, like, I made myself very hard to move. They pushed me out of the pool. We're finished. Pushed me out of the pool, up the stairs of the pool, <laughs> And told me that if I don't jump, I, they're going to push me into the pool. And they're boys. They're big ones. They're little. And I stood at the side of the pool, and I, and I see them cannonball all the time. And I know that thing's going to happen to me. But the fear in my body, and I'm, and I'm laughing at myself. I'm giggling. I'm cracking up out loud. I'm like, what are you so afraid of? There's nothing to be afraid of. You're going to jump into the pool. You just, like, walk into the pool. Just make believe you're just walking into the pool. It's not a big deal. You could do this. And I was terrified of doing this cannonball or whatever, just jumping into the pool. Terrified of it. Why? Because I never did it before. Because somewhere in my in my brain, I put a wall up. Like I don't do that. Oh, that's not my type. Oh, that's not. I don't do that. That's not me. 
I don't do that. I don't do that. Why? Why not? I don't know. I just don't do that. Why don't you do that? Because bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, I'm scared. Underneath, there's a fear. Fear paralyzes us in life. Period. Remember that? Underline it. Highlight it. Fear is your wheelchair. It's your wheelchair. Nah, nah, nah. What do you, you, you don't want to admit to yourself that you're afraid. So you just say, nah, I'm not in the mood, or not my type, or other people do that, not me. You're selling yourself stories. You're selling yourself so many stories. I jumped in that pool. I got water in my ears and my nose and everything. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun for me. But you know what? I did something that day that I never did before. Do something every day that scares you just a little bit, and you're going to find your life going like this. Not like all the people in the world today. Barely getting by. Barely smiling. Like, so you see someone smiling and you're like, what's up with them? Why are they so happy? We're all supposed to be happy all the time. It's just that these screens and the stuff that we're eating, that toxic food that we're eating with all the sugar in it, makes us mummies and dummies. And then we wonder why we have to take all this medication and I don't know what, go to therapists all day because we're so depressed. So we got to break out of our own cycles and that's the reality. No one's coming to save you. Nobody's coming to save you. I don't care what your mother and father are like. They're not going to save you. I promise you. We make our life, we make our beds, and we sleep in them. And the way to get more energy in your life is to come out of your comfort zone just a little bit every single day. A little bit, a little tiny bit. Walk up to somebody on the street and say, Hi, hope you have a great day. That's not something that you do? Do it. Have a great day, guys. And bring the book next week. Any Sephardim story, yeah.